So welcome, welcome everyone to this uh, beautiful, I'm, I'm so excited about the discussion tonight, uh, Myth, Mycelium and Rewilding Masculinity with Sophie Strand. So good evening, Sophie. <laughs> um, you know, when I first read about uh, your writings and um, not just the theme you're going to share about tonight, but I, I don't know, I think a friend introduced us and uh, I was reading your post and my heart got starting to beat faster and I got really excited about it. I was like, oh, wow, what an amazing way to weave uh, those different subjects. Um, and obviously, the, some of the theme are, are quite, uh, I would say, uh, apropos or in the time of now, like rewilding masculinities, especially for me as a white man. And so I'm really interested in that subject. Uh, but this has the idea of mixing and weaving myth, the mycelium, our little friends. <laughs> and that subject got re really excited. So uh, I want just to, for people that are new here or maybe don't know Sophie or that will listen to the recording, I just want to read quickly the, the bio of Sophie before we, we dive in. So Sophie Strand is a poet historical fiction writer and essayist based in the Hudson Valley, like an hour, an hour and a half from where I live, with a focus on the intersection of spirituality and ecology. Her first book of essays, The Flooring Wound, Lunar Kings, Lichenized Lover, I love that, by the way, such a beautiful way <laughs> to weave those words, Transpecies Magicians and Rhizomatic Harpist Heal the Masculine is forthcoming from Sacred Planet Books in her traditions. And she has three chapbooks, Love Song to a Blue God, and those other flowers to come, and The Approach. Her writing has been published by the Dark Mountain Projects, Poetry.org, Unearth, Braided Way Magazine, Critics Magazine, and Your Impossible Voice. And you can follow our work and poetry on Facebook, Facebook, sorry, and Instagram at Cosmogini. So spirituality and ecology. So as a first question, how did this came about for you, Sophie? How did you started being interested in that subject? And how did these two things somehow touched for you the first time? What brought you there in that first touching point? Spirituality and ecology, you mean, or myth? and masculinity spirituality and ecology um well i was raised by parents who um are pretty much folkloric animists and i was raised you know with possums in our house swans a chinese goose who would come into my bedroom and sleep beside me so um i i don't think i've ever experienced spirituality and ecology as being separate and the real disjunction has been that the culture does and that it does seem like my work to begin to language a way back to the land, to reroute ourselves. We have a root system, but we have to sink back down into it. So, um, but interestingly enough, I have always seen myself as a fiction writer, as a poet and a fiction writer. And I arrived at the, these nonfiction essays through a very long project, Rewilding the Gospels writing an ecological feminist reimagining of the story of Rabbi Yeshua, otherwise known as Jesus. So after spending years studying with theologians and rabbis and mystics and scholars, biblical scholars, um, and writing this book, and also really immersing myself in the ecology of a Galilee and realizing that Jesus was a oral based, nature obsessed storyteller, mm -hmm. um, I started to understand that there are other ways of being a man <laughs> that we have forgotten because there has been a conflation of masculinity and patriarchal capitalism um, that has created a narrative dysbiosis. Only one narrative has really been acknowledged for a long time when the truth is there's always a biodiversity of narratives. You know, a forest is resilient in as much as it has many different forms of life that can adapt and change, help each other, nourish each other, die back, grow, 
Um, and we always need more stories. One story is never going to be good enough. So, you know, I was reading about those male figures that you've worked or your research, uh, Dionysus, Orpheus, Tolkien, uh, Rabbi Yeshua, Merlin the Wizard, King David. Um, so do you think there's still, for me, you know, when I think of it, I see this very, still very strong male figure and maybe in Yeshua, I see something maybe a little bit more softer, a little bit more feminine in it. But a lot of the masculine archetypes are historical figures that are in our collective stories, in our society or cultures, have been, I think, sometimes very often colonized by patriarchy and maybe even just in the way the tales are, are told. So do you think that colonization is very ancient? That's one of the questions I was asking myself. Oh, maybe it's been colonized since the beginning. Like there was this way of telling story about men that was very different. Or do you think it's something more recent? And what's religion has to do with it does religion was the big part of it or it was just a collective just way of telling story about the strong man so here's something really interesting i think one of the big differences is the movement from oral collaborative storytelling when um stories were always adapted and changing as the climate changed the social situations um shifted and that story was always relational, interstitial, happening between people who were trying to make something work for a specific moment, a specific ecology. And the problem is when we enter into written culture, our myths ossify, they no longer change. Who are we to think that two years of a very young rabbi's life could be extrapolated to hundreds of different ecosystems for over 2000 years, never changing and somehow be nutritious? And helpful. Um, what I really believe is that there's a shift and it's very hard to identify and we're always looking for an origin and a source and it's impossible. You know how many different mythologists have tried to do that? Joseph Campbell, James Hillman, Alt Freud, all of these people have tried to identify a source. You know, is it the movement from oral culture to phonetic alphabetic scriptural language? Is it the movement from um, nomadic tribes, people who live and move with the landscape to sessile agricultural communities? I mean, an argument can be made for all of these different shifts and transitions. What I'm interested in is this moment where we move from orienting animals and fungi and plants and the more than human world to individual heroic narratives. And I think a really interesting example is Crete. Um, Rian Eisler has written a lot about this, Anne Baring, Jules Cashford. There's plenty of historical, um, Carl Karenny's book on Dionysus is great. But what you see there is this very um, archeological um, linear transition from a culture that does not believe in linear time or in the importance of human beings. All of its art is about natural forms, about bulls, about bees, about dancing, about joy. Suffering and pain and individual human stories are not centered. But then the Kurgan hordes and these northern tribes come down. And the best way, I mean, this is what you're saying, I think, when you talk about these figures that are very rigid and patriarchal, is the best way to destroy a story is not to try and destroy it completely, but to co-opt it. And, and that way, because you, you can't get rid of it, you can't tear the roots out of the ground. But what if you, what if you change it? What if you pervert it? And I think a really good example of that is the Minotaur of the story of Theseus, which is the Minotaur is turned into this monster at the center of the labyrinth that Theseus, the ultimate patriarchal hero, has to go in and kill. And Ariadne, the sister of the Minotaur, betrays her brother, and then Theseus absconds with her, rapes her, and leaves her. Um, and actually, if you go back through the legends, you can see that there is a pre-Olympic story that has been co-opted, that there was an original bull god that you can see through all of the dispersed bull cults where the bull is actually the, um, the deity um, that was centered on Crete and that the Minotaur had a name, which was Asterion, the starry one, not exactly the name of a monster. And in fact, the labyrinth and Ariadne 
Ariadne associated with sweetness, with mead, with fermentation, that we see in older, more Neolithic culture, where it's not, you know, it's not matriarchy, it's not a woman on top of um, men, it's not equal and opposite, it's participatory, and it's not oriented towards the human, it's oriented towards the theriomorphic bull god, towards the lunar cycles, towards a respect for both the sky and the ground. That's beautiful. I like that you remind us of that, you know, and I, I was thinking, you know, when we think of, for example, uh, Rabbi Yeshua or the Christ, you know, we don't know nothing from his birth to his first adventure as a young man. So we don't see, you know, his mother really breastfeeding him. I mean, there's a couple of, you know, image out there and they were, you know, said quite scandalous by the church. We don't know his youth and his adolescence. We don't know the presence of women around him in the community for him to become that man. Obviously, you know, if we believe that figure existed, he grew up in a community. So, and there was a matriarchal community too, not just patriarchal. There was a lot of women involved in those communities. Um, so I guess, you know, the writer were men and they kind of focused on, on that part of the story. But when we trying as you know even when we think of Campbell and we see the hero's journey some people had some comments in the past they well that's a very patriarchal and a very masculine way to look at a hero journey and is there a place there for this more feminine figure as a support of those masculine figures or is it always very separated you know, I'm always kind of a little bit like, well, that's great, but are we just trying to oppose two different systems here? What about something more common? And that wants to bring me into the, the mycelium stories, you know, that's trying to weave with everything. That's not trying to separate. That's trying to connect. Yeah, I think there's, um, I really have a problem with oppositional, oppositional dualism that they're not really located in nature. They're not necessarily biological. We look at our two hands, we have two eyes, and so we think everything comes in twos. But the truth is that we're much more on a continuum, that we're looping metabolically with our earth, that we are processes, that our cells turn over seven, every seven years. Our cells themselves are the product of symbiogenesis, of different organelles coming together. We have more bacterial cells in our body than we do human cells. So what is a hero's journey? How many heroes make up a hero's journey? How many, you know, how many lovers are involved in two people making love in the Hieros Gamos? That's what I write about, you know. I think about Lycan in, re in relationship to this gendered idea of the masculine and the feminine, the bride and the bridegroom coming together for the sacred union. I think actually you have a fungi, you have a bacteria, you have a yeast, you have many, many constituent parts coming together um, to create a greater whole, a holobiont, an assemblage of different competing, sometimes discordant, sometimes um, collaborative needs. Um, yeah, I really look to ecology to problematize this hegemonic idea of heteronormativity, of gendered dualisms. Um, and I think, so sometimes I, I, I I hesitate to say, let's balance it out with the femininity. I want to say, let's balance it out with the vegetal anarchism of Dionysus, who exists inter interstitially. He's much more mycelial. Um, mm. And I think, actually, it might be really interesting to talk about my theory of mycelium. Is that okay? Yes, please. This is your stage. <laughs> what I really like to think of with these legends and with myths is that if we really look at them, they, they seem to be on a continu continuum with each other and yet specifically situated to the, to the ecologies and the social situations in the cities they arrive in. So we have, have Osiris in Egypt, a vegetal dying resurrection god. We have Attis, the Phrygian god, dying resurrecting. We have um, Dionysus, Orpheus, dying resurrecting. And then we have Jesus, all in different places. But if we think of mycelium as being that underground fungi, made of these tubular one cell width hyphae that you know slowly spread out in this very non-hierarchical curious appetitive way absorbing their food from around them connecting plants connecting trees and we think about mushrooms as being this above ground reproductive event that happens every once in a while 
when they need to sporulate, when they need to reproduce. A mushroom as being very, a very situated poem that reflects the sulfur deposits, the dead wood, the ecological matrix that it's arriving in. Um, but it looks like an individual coming from a much larger, older being below ground. So what I was thinking about as I began to explore myths of the masculine is how do we think about all of these gods as erupting from the same mycelium, as being repro reproductive events that are specific flowerings of place and time, but, um, but coming from a much older, perhaps pre-patriarchal wisdom. So we can see a figure like Dionysus who's been co-opted by the Greeks and then the Romans. And then after that, all of our different successive patriarchal cultures as actually having a deep underground mycelium that is pre-patriarchal and much healthier. How do we get back to that? So, I mean, you're talking about emergence from the roots yeah. on the mycelium of zoo stories. And one of the topics for tonight is that how do we root those stories into ecology? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that interesting because almost like we feel we don't need to do it, we need to reverse the process to look at ecology, at mycelium, at the way nature works, interact, and somehow nature bursts those stories, bursts those archetypes, bursts those heroes. And so they are connected, they are deeply rooted in ecology, basically just by being there, because that's how they being created. Can you talk about that rooting of the stories yeah. into ecologies and what does it mean for you? Because I found it, it was, I've never read that anywhere before. And I was like, okay, this is fascinating. Uh, how do we root those stories into ecology? And is, there, is this a reverse process too, there? So I think that the causal arrows point both ways. I, and up and down. Um, I think that the, it's not all, all about going backwards, it's also about going forward. So I think a good example is Rabbi Yeshua, which is, you know, the synoptic gospels are written by the Romans, the people who ex executed him, a <laughs> hundred years pretty much after he was killed. So you're getting the story of Yeshua in language that doesn't respect his actual context and is about um, removing culpability from the murderers. <laughs> and so what I think is really interesting with Rabbi Yeshua is to say, can we put these parables and these glimmers of stories? And I'm much more interested in the Gnostic texts like Gospel of Thomas, which actually probably predate the Synoptic Gospels and are closer and stranger and more representative of probably his actual um, oral teachings. And can we look at them in the actual ecology of Galilee? This was a Galilean peasant whose stories were very based on nature. A great example is he says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And a mustard seed was the most pernicious problematic weed for a Galilean peasant at that time. It would take over your fields. It was a nightmare. So saying that the kingdom was like a mustard seed is an anarchic, anti-agricultural, wild, paleolithic thing to say to Galilean peasants. Likewise, he says that the kingdom of God is like leaven. He proposes himself as like a fungal god, saying the kingdom of God is like these invisible fungi that inflate the skin of bread with ruach, Hebrew for spirit. You know, it, it's this invisible micro biology of, of divinity. Um, and so if you begin to actually look at the ecological and historical context of that time, his teachings get radical. They're, they're deracinated, they're uprooted from their mycorrhizal, mycelial underground intelligence. And that's why they become simplistic dogma and they're easily grafted onto these different cultures and they lose any kind of real ecological um, relevance. So that's the rerouting, the going back, the looking at the details, looking at Plutarch, Josephus, you know, we have actually a lot of historical research from that time period. Um, but there's also revision, there's composting. And compost is my favorite metaphor, which is there's taking all of this historical research, there's taking all of the nastiness, there ta there's taking your own ecology outside. Jesus teaches us how to be local. He says, mm, you can learn about Ga Galilean ecology, but the best thing for you to do is to create parables and stories that respect 
the plants, the herbal lore, the indigenous history, the animate wildness of where you live and your community. And to tell stories and to create meals and community. I mean, his big teaching is, at the end of the day, is communal meals where everyone is invited and nature-based storytelling. <laughs> mm. So, and that's the moving forward is saying, how can we actually root this? We're rooting the myth we're taking it away from the co-opted patriarchal deracinated realm and rooting it back in its original ecology. But then we're learning from that rerooted myth how to root back into our own landscape and our own local. So I want to go even deeper in that. And I love where it's going. So, you know, there's a lot of research now that shows that obviously there is a, a mycelium that connect all the trees and the plants, yeah. the microbes, the viruses, the bacteria. You know, I was reading that in one spoon of soil, there is more living organism than humans on the planet. Oh yeah. More than 10 billion organism in one spoon of soil. That put us into a humble position and in a perspective. So there is an intelligence there. There is something that's at work that's much, much bigger, that's invisible because it's either really small or we haven't really understood it yet. We don't even have the science to really explore it. And that's connected to our mind, to the way we create stories, to the way we speak. So how does that, you know, someone is mentioning the subconscious collective. And in the subconscious collective, I want to include, you know, the one-legged the four-legged, the one with no leg, like the viruses. How does it, that probably inform even the way not only we come as human being, but we tell stories in the way it also inform tree species to be born, birds to sing specific songs that nobody taught them. So is there an influence from something much more collective beyond the species, the human species, that is somehow infusing that and that's maybe counterbalancing the the culture or the religious you know dogma that is present and maybe yeah. you don't have the answer but what's your kind of what's in your heart when i say that yeah well i have to hope so i ha i mean i think the thing that i always want to to share is storytelling is not a human activity and stories are not always told with language and they're not always told with a human instant you know, one eighteenth of a second. <laughs> That's the, the amount of time that time refuses to change for us that we experience. But you know, that instant is different for a tick or a fly or an oak tree or a landscape or a mountain. And I, I, I think that I always, some, uh, something I, I, an exercise I often encourage people to is something I call kaleidoscopic empathy. It's a kind of storytelling, which is, can you sit outside and can you look around you and sense all of these different types of being? And can you imagine for a second what it's like to be a fly, a yellow jacket, a russula mushroom, a turkey tail mushroom, a fox, the river itself, a molecule in the river, a photon of light bouncing into your eye? And can you begin to refract through all of these different umwelts, I think is what Jacob von Uxel calls it these different sensory experiences, these different temporalities. Um, and it's gonna necessarily fail, but it's a muscle that we need to build so that when we're making decisions, it's not always from a human context. And so I think that this is available and indigenous cultures and older stories show us that this type of storytelling that isn't so focused on the fiction of human individuality is possible. And I think that it's up to us to start centering stories that aren't about language and that aren't about humans and aren't about linearity. Yes, and you know what well, it reminds me of the, the work of Joanna Macy, the work that I reconnect. Yeah. And a year ago or a year and a half ago, I was in Tasmania and I did one of those workshop. And part of the two or three days uh, workshop is to do a council of all beings where each and every participant, so we had to go in the forest and decide who we wanted to be in that forest. We could be the mushroom, we could be the oak trees, we could be the fly, we could be the sun. 
and to create a mask to create decoration on our bodies and then we sat in circle and we gave voice to those plants or animals and trees um i was the mycelium the mushroom because i'm fascinated by them <laughs> And it was interesting after sitting for literally a few hours, really tapping into what it would be to be the mycelium, to be the mushroom, what came out of my mouth, the way I was speaking about my capacity to basically bring death back to life, to use dead materials and to make it alive, to really be that invisible stream of consciousness under the ground like you say, we just look at what pops out, but the mushrooms are the oldest and the largest living organism on the planet as we know it today. It's not the sequoia tree, it's mycelium on the ground. And I think if one of them is on the West Coast, the largest one. So um, do you think, you know, I've spent a lot of time with native communities in South Dakota and they have a lot of stories, narrative, creation stories and stories that relate those voices not just the voices of their people but the voices of the rooted people of the stone people of the winged people and so it's in their culture to basically include those voices so the voices are not just masculine or feminine it's not just some heroes that are you know two-legged there is a lot of other archetypes energies that are present there so in today's world, where we have such a hard capacity to really listen to nature, to hear it, to take action about it, how do we do that as a more Western way to reconnect to those voices without looking a little bit crazy? You know, if I were to go back to my old job in New York City and I tell people I was a mushroom for a few hours and I was speaking uh, for the mushroom, for the mycelium kingdom, people will probably look at me like, oh my God, this person is crazy uh but there was so much wisdom there so I, how do we do that in a culture that is not native or not you know we're all native from somewhere but that doesn't have that tribal ancestral and especially we don't have any more those creation stories we don't have those old tales i mean we have a little bit of it but we've really lost most of it so how do we do that to bring back those stories into our culture so we can expand our heart to a broader voice to a council of all beings. You know, it's funny you bring up the Joanna Macy thing because I created this, this process that was very personal and I didn't really share it with anyone. And then when I shared it, they were like, oh, that sounds like Joanna Macy's Council of All Beings. And I was like, sure does, I guess, you know, collective unconscious, which is for about six or seven years now, I've been doing this experience every morning where I summon by name every being, microbial, viral, um, indigenous, historical, mountain, every type of stone, every grass that I know by name in a 20 mile radius. And I bring them, it takes a long time. It usually so that takes you five or six hours every morning, I'm asking. <laughs> it takes me a long time. And it takes, it takes me waking up, making my coffee, going on my run. It usually takes me my whole run, like five miles. Um, and I bring all those beings into relationship with me so that throughout my day, as I make decisions and tell stories, I have a council around me, but I also have witnesses. I know that every decision I make is not about an individual. It's about thousands of beings. And um, so, so that's one very personal practice. And I, for me, it's hard. I live in an area where the Lenape and the Muncie Lenape were wiped out. And we have traces of their legends and their stories, and we do have descendants. But if we get overly fixated on them, and that's the only thing we're doing, we're fetishizing these colon, pretty much colonizer versions of a people's stories who were genocided. So it, it but you know, it's important to know that lore and to weave it in, but it also, just as I said before, it has to root up and adapt to the specific place we are now. And so something that I like to encourage people to do is pay attention to what you love. We all can't, you know, there's this idea, this very capitalist idea that's been, you know, unfortunately injected into the idea of environmentally environmentalism is that you have to care about everything equally the same in the same way. But the truth is everybody is going to follow their love to the beings, to the landscape, to the ecosystem they're going to specifically represent. And for me, you know, I 
realized very early on that I loved mushrooms and fungi and mold. <laughs> and it was funny, later on, there was a kind of weird um, resonance where I found out I have a genetic connective tissue disease and mycelium are the connective tissue of the soil. So it's been, it's a, it's a very layered stratigraphic love for me. It's both mythic, it's lyrical, it's biological, it's physical, macrocosmic, microcosmic, but not everyone is going to love fungi. Some people are going to love grasses or black bears or foxes or weather systems. And I think that the way you're going to tell interesting stories is by paying attention to what you love and read scientific articles, take herb walks, you know, find out about indigenous lore, talk to other people, figure out what their experiences are. I mean, anecdotal um, knowledge is some of my favorite. You know, gather people around a table, serve them some food and say, tell me about some weird experiences you've had with animals in this area. And maybe give them a glass of wine, <laughs> you know, tell your own weird story. And you said like, how do you not look insane? You do look insane. Sometimes I say to people, magic is that story that to share it with someone, you risk looking mad. And you know, ecological connection is also that story with which when you share, you risk seeming insane. Yeah, you, you know, I, it, it's funny you say that because if you look at the world from even a very rational perspective, it looks quite insane. <laughs> <laughs> it looks quite crazy, you know, and if you're very rooted in your bodies and into a land and into nature, the world can even look pretty scary, you know, or a place where there's a lot of insanity going around. Mm -hmm. So, and because we talk about Joanna Macy and that work, so, you know, we are in that big transformation of this earth uh, due to human activity and populations and the way we relate to nature. Um, so how does stories and myth have a place in that age we are in or even in a pandemic that we are still in? You know, we, we don't know for how long. Who knows? Maybe more years. We, we have no idea. So how do we bring storytelling here in a society that's really looking for facts, for square things, for science? And what is the place of storytelling? What is the place of myth? Because when I go to South Dakota, it has a huge place for me. It gives me connection to magic. It gives me a connection to hope. It gives me connection to, oh, this happened before. And this is what people did. So how do we bring that in, in a society that sometimes can be quite, I don't want to say masculine or patriarchy. I just think it's a very scientific, very square society where the mind has a lot of space, but the heart doesn't have that much, sadly. How do we do that? Well, one thing I've been really doing with my work lately is there's an idea that science is antagonistic to um, myth, to storytelling. But the truth is, you know, the poet Robert Brinker says, you know, science is trying to explain nature with quantities and myth is trying to do it by personifying the elements. So they're actually doing very similar work. There has been a impoverishment of what science means as it's been conflated with this material reductionist viewpoint that doesn't actually represent the original scientific imperative, which is to question, to constantly adapt, to be interdisciplinary and to be moving through nature knowing that you don't always have the answer. And so I actually think that what I'm trying to do is to show that science actually troubles our idea of a solid universe and troubles our idea of individuality. And in fact, science and myth are increasingly proving each other, you know, very, very similar. And so with my storytelling, I'm trying to show that we can soften and merge these disciplines in ways that create new, um, new medicines. You know, a lichen is a, um, is a being that has different beings come into it that then create compounds that can't be produced when those beings are separate. And I think as we, as we work across disciplines and across ecosystems and across beliefs, we can create medicines for this incredibly complicated moment that we would never produce if we didn't come together and work across differences. 
And I'm not one for homogenizing differences. I think we have to acknowledge our situated ecosystems, our beliefs, our needs, but we also have to sometimes refract into inhabit another person, another being, another landscape's perspective. Yeah, so if we're in, a, obviously we are in a system with nature, we are in a system with each other. Um, you know, we are in what's called very often the Anthropocene, you know, and I was listening to an author the other day that said, well, we need to move to the Planthropocene, you know, to the centered around plant society instead of Anthropocene. So we see ourselves in a very vertical way we have a higher evolved mind, we know better, we have access to science, self-reflections. Um, when we look at the world that way, we lose, I think, very often our capacity to feel into a relationship, you know, because we separate ourselves. In nature, in the forest, if any species try to separate itself, itself it will be wiped out. There is no anger really in the forest. There is no, you know, uh, things like that, but there is species that disappear and some other species that appear. So are we a little bit egotistic or yeah, human centric, anthropocentric here, thinking that somehow we st we're still relevant in that earth story. And maybe, you know, people always want to hear that, or maybe sometimes people say, oh, we are the virus. I, I don't believe we are the virus, but maybe we're just one of the species that, you know, has lived its time here. And in nature, when a species, you know, is in disharmony or in disconnection, other species take over. So the mycelium would do that. You know, if a tree dies and once a tree, you know, has been processed, the mycelium moves somewhere else. So is it something that in the myth, and the story and in ecology relating to our ecological collapse or societal collapse, can we see that happening? Or do you think there's a bigger story at play here? There's something, it's not about hope, in fact, not even. It's just like, is this the system we're in? Is this the ecology of being human beings on this planet? And our ecological time is just shifting, evolving, and maybe disappearing, who knows? different of ways into that. One is the personal, which is as someone with an incurable genetic disease, I oftentimes feel like my, my very presence disrupts progress. I'm falling apart. I'm decomposing. I'm watching myself become a compost heap. How can that be delicious and complicated and interesting? And how, how can I be inside of that in a way that I is a gift to other people to and to the grass and the beings around me. My, you know, how, how can my appetites plug me into my ecological niche, knowing that someday I will be appetitively devoured and transformed by the mycelium and the bacteria and the dirt. Um, so that's the microcosm. That's the very personal way into it. Um, the bigger thing I want to I want to share is we're very stuck inside this uh, arrow of time, which is really, really um, fictional. <laughs> this idea that everything evolves towards some kind of goal, some kind of constant betterment. When the truth is that evolution even is not linear. It is a series of radical, courageous, transversal intimacies and collaborations. That there are these moments of transversal gene um, genes penetrating each other, that species will exchange genes, that things happen horizontally and unpredictably. Um, and I think this is a moment, so Anthropocene feels like a, ugh, like not a great word because it doesn't really reflect how the, um, how ecocide has not been evenly dispersed and distributed, um, how there are whole peoples who have not contributed to this experience, that it's not just the anthropos, the man that has done this, it is, you know, the capitalist scene, the plantation scene. I think I want to move into, and I think this word belongs to the environmental ecologist Glenn Albrecht, is the symbiocene of saying, you know, my story is not about an individual, it's not about a species, it's about intertanglement, it's about me hooking myself to an animal that's going extinct and saying, I'm going to tell your story. I'm going to wed myself to you. I'm going to go marry the blue corner butterfly that's going extinct and make my whole life about being an intimate queer relationship with this being. 
I'm going to acknowledge my culpability and my um, constant metabolic looping with the bacteria, the soil biome, the trees outside my, my door. Um, and I think if, if we can begin to feel ourselves horizontally penetrating, like the mycelium that are going into root systems, connecting, they are, you know, the underground mycelium is constituted by non-hierarchical connections, by connectivity. Um, the intelligence that only happens between beings. Yeah, I, I really love that, that perspective you're giving here. You know, I'm thinking about the amount of trauma in our society um, that's unprocessed. And so in our bodies, unprocessed traumas, you know, uh, the society is not always very safe. There's always, you know, some kind of threat, either economical, social, or, you know, if you're a person of color, or, you know, gender, that's not accepted. So our bodies can be quite traumatized in those, in those places. So when we are in those places, it's very hard, hard to feel transverse or horizontal and to find your connection even between human beings, you know, because you, you are isolated or you want to separate yourself. So what's the role of ecology or how can myth, let's bring it back to myth, how can myth help us to reconnect first with each other so we can reconnect to that broader ecology that's around us? Because I feel if you, you know, I always wonder, you know, when people go and in, in the ocean and wiped out all the fishes there and just don't feel anything or wipe a forest like in Tasmania right now in the Tarkine and say, well, it's just my job, it's just to make money, but don't experience any pain or any compassion. I have to ask myself, well, it's probably this heart must be pretty closed, you know, is because there's some danger to make money and to survive in that system. How do we get those hearts to open? And what's the story in the myth part? What the part, sorry, of the myth to really help that, those greater stories in the human narrative that could help us to kind of embrace each other first. <laughs> well, I think a great, a great story for me, well, first I'd say find the story that you love because the story that you love will yield the most fruit. And the story that I've loved for a long time has been Tristan and Zold. In the story of Tristan it predates the Arthurian myth that's probably Celtic and Irish in origin and then flows into a Christianized England and the Dark Ages and becomes a very complicated syncretic <laughs> being. Um, and Tristan for me has always seemed like a good representation of the hero's journey gone awry, a character that constantly wants to leave England and go to Ireland to be wounded so that he can leave the constant grind of questing. You know, he puts himself in suicidal situations. He jumps off of cliffs. He jumps into a boat without, um, without oars and a sail and goes out into the ocean. He's constantly trying to leave the romantic um, human story of progressing and fighting and doing. Um, and I think for me, Tristan has always been a really good um, mirror that healing isn't always a story and that, that trauma doesn't always happen in a way that can be languaged and can be a series of events, that it happens outside the story. And it happens when you lie on the ground and let your nervous system finally regulate, not with a therapist necessarily, not with a program, but against the very heartbeat of the earth. I think sometimes that we try and pretend like our answers are always going to come from another human being. But you know, when we're traumatized by human beings, another human being is going to heal us. And yeah, human beings can offer incredible healing to each other. But there is also healing right outside our door. And I think myths can show us just Tristan was always trying to, I think Tristan is a great fit figure and also the wizard Merlin. And the wizard Merlin in his oldest um, versions, who was probably a historical figure. And if you're looking for a book that kind of goes through all of the different documents, um, The Quest for Merlin by Nikolai Tolstoy is a great, great book, which shows that it, he was this bardic figure that would come to inspire kings in battle and to give prophetic advice about how to do these battles. But then he would be so horrified by the violence and by the death of the king or his friends that he would go into the forest and go mad and oftentimes turn into a stag 
or run with wild pigs, and that he was always going back into the forest. And I think for me, both Tristan and Merlin, who I think actually are probably on a deep mycelial continuum, um, show that they come into the world of men, they teach kings, you know, in T.H. Um, White's um, great book about Arthur, the figure of Merlin comes and teaches Arthur how to inhabit the minds of different animals in order to be king. To be king, you have, that's a great story. That's a great myth that teaches us about ecology, which is you have to practice these different, more than human minds to be a king of men. That to be a king of men, you have to think like non-men. Um, <laughs> yeah, so those are two, two figures for me, Tristan and Merlin, who have showed me that we must always be going out of the world of men in order to understand what it is to be in the world of men. Mm. So are there any uh, modern example of those ancient mythic figures? You know, we're talking about sometimes very ancient figures or some are a bit more recent, but do you see any modern example? I feel, you know, it's great to have your heroes in your beautiful book and read about ancient Egypt or ancient Israelites and things like that. But can we look in the world today and find those more medical figures in some kind of modern example here around us? Yeah, and live it yourself. I mean, for me, I, so this is this research all culminated in a book. And the book starts with a note on situated storytelling, which says, you know, I was growing up, I grew up with these myths. So that's why I'm going to rewild them. But this is a conversation. Please rewild your own myths. So, you know, I never want to monologue. It should always be a collaboration of us all rewilding our specific myths. For me, a figure who I love is Tom Bombadil from uh, Tolkien. And so that's a very modern fictional character that for me is pretty mythic. And Tom Bombadil was there to heal, hear the first acorn, you know, to see the first raindrop fall. Tom Bombadil predates all the characters in Lord of the Rings and somehow predates even the origin story of Middle Earth. You know, when asked about who Tom Bombadil was in, um, in discourses and letters, Tolkien kind of would always try to evade it. He'd give different answers. And finally, sometimes he would say, I don't know who Tom Bombadil is. <laughs> so for me, Tom Bombadil is this great representation of what Tolkien eventually said was the fairy, which is he didn't really believe that Middle Earth didn't exist, that he had made it up. He actually believed that he went and got Middle Earth from somewhere else. And so for me, Tom Bombadil is this kind of ecstatic vegetal creature that doesn't come from before in history or the future. Tom Bombadil comes from the somewhere else. Mm, it's beautiful. Any alive mythic figures that are for you, uh, your modern heroes that you look at and say, you know what, those are beautiful archetypes or ways you know, to look at those mythical figures, someone that really incarnates those heroes? I I mean, I have a lot of human heroes and I mean, I've been working with men, but mostly my heroes are women. Um, I've been working with men more trying to, to heal my relationship with the masculine personally. And that has been a very complicated and interesting and generative experience. So of course I could say HD Octavia Butler, who I have on the wall over here, um, Audre Lorde, um, Virginia Woolf. Bob Dylan is great. Bob Dylan, who seems to channel, you know, to in, in embody all these different personalities. Bob Dylan is great. I would say, you know, Bob Dylan circa 60s and 70s is definitely one of these wild vegetal god channeling um, a foliage of faces, a polyphonic being, not really resting in any sort of one individuality. But I would say that my heroes are non-human. And I am always trying, you know, over the past two years, I've had a long mentorship with a woodchuck. When I say woodchuck, I mean probably a lot of different woodchucks. And I didn't pick this mentor, it picked me and I kind of denied it for a long time. I kept saying like, really? Woodchuck is not super sexy, not super fun. Is this really gonna be the one I'm working with? And I was like, yeah, this is it. And Tell me more, I, I want to hear about that woodchuck now. Tell me more, what, what, what has he told you so far? Well, woodchuck told me that it's not important to be sexy and to be cool and to be constantly doing something that it's okay to get deep into the ground and make your burrow and eat your good food and kind of hold tight and to be a little funny and that real spirituality is always going to have a good sense of humor. It's not going to take itself too seriously. 
And I think at the very start of quarantine, I've been through a lot of personal change. And I have always looked to animals and to plants and to fungi for advice. And I was looking for advice and I think I was expecting it to be, you know, I usually had big animal encounters. I thought it was going to be a mountain lion. I've had encounters with mountain lions or a bald eagle. But every time I would go to my sit spot, a woodchuck would come and sit beside me and look at me like this. And I was like, really you? <laughs> and I started to feed them. They started to charge me. And then one day I had this moment, I've written about this in an essay. I was driving home from seeing my friend on the highway and there was a giant storm and I was in the dividing line up against the divider was a soaking wet wood check. And it was, it was not gonna be able to make it to the other side or back. And I was like, I actually didn't think. I just parked my car in the middle of the highway, got out, went like this, and the woodchuck jumped into my arms. And I held the woodchuck and I ran across the highway and then I shoved it into the forest. And it was one of those moments where I thought, okay, maybe my purpose in my entire life was this moment. Maybe I am not the main character. Maybe it was about this. <laughs> and I think that's something I always want to offer is like maybe we are not the main character. Maybe we are being orchestrated to do something. Another thing I think about is this fungus, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, that infects insects, in particular ants, and then coordinates their behaviors to um, walk up grass stalks or plant stalks and bite it at a certain vein. And then the ant is effectively the fungus and a mushroom pops out of its head and sporulates. And so the ant becomes the fungus. And something I ask myself a lot is, what am I going to be a mouth for? What am I going, what is working through me? Maybe I'm not the main character. Maybe something else is telling its story through me. Yeah, I'm thinking about what you mentioned at the beginning of our talk, you know, the number of bacteria we have in our gut, which is, you know, higher than the number of cells in our body. So maybe I'm just a host and I'm just moving those bacteria and those viruses around and, you know, I'm being, you know, like a, the zombie hands, like you just mentioned, <laughs> I'm being just controlled, you know, by that. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by bees because I'm, I'm also a beekeeper and, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at them and we think of bees are very evolved and, and, you know, obviously very intelligent as a hive and as a colony. But when we really look at the interaction between bees and plants, it's really the plants that have evolved to direct the bees and tell them what to do, you know. They have changed their shape, their ultraviolet colors that bees only can see literally with a landing strip on the flower to show them where the nectar is. So there's a higher intelligence somehow in the plants that have evolved to direct the bee to help them reproduce. But when we look at the bees going around, it's like, oh, the plant is just there and the bees is moving around. But for me, it's another example of really looking at plants saying, Huh, there is something extremely wise here that are more, more ancient that, than bees. Even if bees have been around for a long time, those plants have been around for much longer. So when we look at that, do you sometimes think of the earth as this being that is basically through the mycelium and through all the species basically having its own mind? And I'm careful with the term here. I want maybe intelligence is a better term. And that is basically directing things. But what about the human experience then? You know, what we're doing right now doesn't feel like there is something really controlling us or directing us. It seems more like the asylum a little bit. <laughs> I think that it's really nice to hold the paradox of being part of a mind and having a mind. And I think that's the whole idea of polar keys, which is, you know, and of emergent systems, which is of many different minds coming together to act as a larger mind, a larger mind that can only exist through the combination of different minds. Um, and there's, there's a certain type of interpretation of panpsychism and of consciousness, I think it's integrated information theory, which is that everything must have a mind in order to make larger minds. That, that mind is an accretion of minds. <laughs> and um, which is kind of what I like to think about, which is I am an accretion of minds and I am also constituting another mind. And that kind of oscillating between that cosmic 
aliveness, and then that very particular situated, rooted, flower-like mind that I am in a very particular place can be a beautiful exercise. And for moments when we're experiencing excruciating pain, physical, emotional, knowing that we're also operating as part of this larger cognition, this larger sensation, matrix of looping matter, um, that the cells of a hummingbird have, have moves with the hummingbird and into me, that we are all just patterns of heat <laughs> and of appetite interpenetrating. That can be tender when we feel confined by our individual pain. But then when we're making love or falling in love, there's something extraordinarily powerful about being in your body, your particular body and your particular place. So I think both have to exist contiguously. Mm. So is this where the imperative of rewilding the masculine, you know, uh, maybe the feminine too, but rewilding the masculine because that's the theme of tonight is like this imperative to basically bring ecology, myth, and basically that's my question. What is rewilding of masculinities? What are the steps? How do we do that? How do we bring myth and ecology into it? I think we have to realize that we don't know what masculinity is. The minute we say we know what it is, we put it in a box. I think for me, the main guiding figure was Dionysus. That Dionysus is always in mythology spoken of as a new god as of being young, as being foreign, as being outside of the pantheon he's arriving into, as being girl-like, as being goat-like, as being man-like, <laughs> as being in flux and never arriving alone, always arriving with leopards and goats and satyrs and maenads, as always being a kind of an inspiring emergent behavior, not arriving on some kind of calendrical time, but mushroom-like, popping up after the rain, surprising. And for me, Dionysus represents the unpredictability of masculinity. It, it's a lot, there should be a biodiversity of stories about what it means to be masculine. Stories that are um, wild, tender, strange, healing. Um, stories that represent different landscapes, different relationships with animals. I, what I've been trying to think about is capitalism has said there's only one story of masculinity. It's about the hero's journey, it's about force, it's about extractive eroticism and extractive, um, an extractive relationship with women, with the earth, with other peoples, with other landscapes. But what if we didn't try and kill that off? What if we tried to overwhelm it with a biodiversity of stories? What if we tried to tell lots and lots of different stories and bring a lot of different voices in, a lot of different myths, both, both past, both new, <laughs> but personal macrocosmic and overwhelm the monologuing pathogen <laughs> um, of capitalist patriarchy. You know, it's like a gut after you've ravaged it with antibiotics, you not, it's, there's too much real estate. And so one pathogen can take over, but the way you heal yourself and of that dysbiosis is not by killing off the pathogen, but by taking a probiotic and by eating fermented foods, by eating a little soil, by creating a kind of contaminated generative fertile compost heap. So the way into that rewilding, you mean, is for, to connect to more stories here, to more, more myth. And when I say more stories, I mean the stories of the beings outside your house, the stories of the people in your life, the, your ancestors, the ancestors of the people you love. Um, more stories, not less, not one. And also let yourself live a different story every day. Something I like to offer for men is, and when I say men, whatever that means, something I like to offer to people is, what if you practiced a species lunation? What if for 28 days you let yourself change your idea of what your story was? You lived a different animal, a different plant story, a different ecosystem story. What if you let yourself live your day differently? What was possible? And to let yourself begin to live by cyclical lunar time rather than this kind of solar arrow of time um, hero's journey um, narrative. I love that. It's beautiful. And it's true, you know, in, in native community and traditions, you know, I, I work a lot with uh, Peruvian um, teachers and we practice what's called plan dieta where for a week 
or months, we are going to drink one plant. You know, I just finished a diet. I was telling you before we started today with the oak tree. And I have a lot of beautiful oak tree on my land. And my teacher that came from Peru, and I thought I was going to diet a trees from the jungles. And now we, we are going to diet one of this tree here. And I had a very, very profound experience to be in connection with that being that I see every day. So we have beautiful oaks around here. Um, and having him starting teaching me and starting to connect in, to connecting, sorry, to the ancient druid of the forest, to that wide old, old speaker, you know, that the council of all the forest that comes around the oak tree that provides so much abundance to the forest. So here I was, you know, in this ancient tradition, and I was like, oh, we never really do that, go into that depth of connection with one species. So aside from doing dieta, which can be quite intense, uh, physically, emotionally, what, what is your practice? You know, I want to tell a little bit about that because we, we have a lot of people listening. What can I do really in my daily life? You talk about a beautiful animal example earlier, but how do I connect more deeply to maybe zoo species to enlarge or to change my story or my myth to reframe it to really get that counsel from other beings i will speak well first i have a question what was the most surprising thing that oak taught you well the first thing he did is that i saw him in a dream because that's often how zoo span speak and he was this druid and he said, I'm the druid. He was this very old man. He had a staff that was pointing to the stars. And he was very old and very uh, still with a lot of vitality. And there was this contrast between being very old, very slow, very wise, and still full of life, never depleted. So he was about that resilience, having so much life force that he will never die, that he could go very, very old. When I came out of my dieta, I look at, because I, don't, I never want to read about them before I go into dieta, because I don't want to get my mind engaged. I want to feel first. And I discovered that the word druid come from the ancient Celt language and means oak tree. That's the same word. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he came out that druid. So it's like, he really introduced himself, you know, who he was. And I've never thought of that. And I didn't make it up because I didn't know about it. So, you know, for me that I do a lot, I'm always on the move. There's a lot of things. And I try to be more, you know, grounded all the time, even if I work on my lands, you know, 10 hours a day. Uh, but I feel it was bringing that energy of you can be very slow in a very fast moving world. You can be very still. And yet you can produce a lot. You can offer a lot. And there was this beautiful contract that we don't see a lot in our society that somehow, because we have become product and we have to do something to add some kind of value for the world, it showed me the value of just standing and sitting there. And that I could see all the animals, all the plants and the, the mycelium and all that coming to him for counsel because of that capacity to stand still. taste that um it felt so real and as someone who spends a lot of time with oak trees and sees their bounty that they somehow produce and offer without moving <laughs> they just do it that feels so correct thank you um to answer your question it sounds like you have your way of doing it the thing that i always want to offer is everyday life is pretty psychedelic we just gate it out we are civilized to reduce the amount of stimulus we create our reality from. But that doesn't mean that our senses aren't taking in sights, smells, sounds, music, songs, stories that want our attention. And I think that sometimes having a sit spot for a series of days, months, years, where you go and you sit for 30 minutes and you don't have any expectations and you just let your, your, expect, your, your sensory um, story relax. And you start to notice something prickling your foot, that the wind is happening, happening a little bit differently today. The sky is a little bit different. 
Maybe a bird shows up three days in a row. What type of bird is that? Is that a robin? What is the robin telling me? What does the robin do? Is this the same robin? Um, and so I think there's a kind of habitual putting yourself in place for the miracle that will arrive if you don't try and author it. Let yourself be a character rather than an author. Let yourself be put in the way of something magical and the magical that is always arriving. I mean, I'm sitting here right now and out my window is the crescent moon, just perfectly framed by my window. And it's perfect and I couldn't have planned it. Um, and those things are happening all the time. If we just, as you said, slow down, start to just feel from our feet up, start to notice what's actually around us, not what's in our expectation of what we should be seeing, but what's actually arriving. Yeah, you know, I was really thinking of that because I was sitting for two weeks in silence with those trees and, you know, no internet, no distraction. Uh, you're not even allowed to read. <laughs> so you really just have to sit with what is there. How loud is our society? And how loud somehow we seek spirituality in a loud way. You know, we go to psychedelics or psychoactive medicine because they are the loud plants. You know, they scream at us. And so we cannot miss their message. But in fact, for me, I enjoyed much more the subtle moments because somehow that message coming from my inside, inward settledness, without altered state of consciousness to say so, or maybe we are always in an altered state of consciousness, <laughs> even when we are awake, it came into my dreams too. But I want to talk about an embodiment there, because I feel, you know, in rewilding the masculinity, a big part of it is returning to our bodies, which in my tradition, in this Peruvian tradition, is the feminine entity. It's the earth. And so the returning to the feminine is a returning to the physical body that require slowing down, that require silence, and that require to feel everything that is inside. That might be anger, rage, grief, you know, impatience, <laughs> things like that. So in that rewilding of the self, I look at the trees and I see how they are standing there, or the animals, and now they are very silent. If you go in the forest, it's quite silent. We're probably the most loud um, species out there. So in your experience, in that rewilding, how much do you place the body into it? And what is the connection to the, to the physical body? Uh, because I understand the myth and the story and the mind and the heart, but the physicality of the body, especially as we are into almost two years of sitting at home, you know, maybe not all of us, but we've been forced to kind of really slow down, really be into our bodies. And it has created a lot of tensions for many people to just have to sit and slow down. So what is that connection here for you in that rewilding? We are not different than our bodies. Our minds are our bodies. I, I sometimes think that the dualism of, of spirit matter that then gets co-opted into the science <laughs> as <laughs> um, mind and matter, um, you know, you can change the terminology, but it's still theology. <laughs> science, Cartesian science is still theology. Um, it, it's a trauma response to, I think, ecological collapse, um, the strife, the plagues, the disasters of um, city-states in the collapse of the Bronze Age, that people become very traumatized in their bodies. So the religions and the spirituality begins to reflect a fear of the body, that there's this want to ascend out of it. And so that dualism becomes apparent. And I think that here's the one thing about embodiment, as someone who's suffered violence and trauma and abuse and um, has incredible physical illness. Embodiment is both our portal into ecstatic participation with our world, our deepest wisdom and our most excruciating pain. <laughs> and what does it mean to become embodied when the portal into embodiment is oftentimes extreme pain? And I think that this moment we're being offered a very complicated sensory experience which is we're going to need to come back into our bodies we our bodies have our, the most important information for us they're taking in all the sensory information you know 
we could probably predict weather. Indigenous people are able to make weather predictions, intuitively understand the differences between plants that scientists can't even understand as different. You know, ethnobotanists are always like, we do not understand how these indigenous people know the difference between these two plants or what they do. And the indigenous people are like, we know, we're in relationships, we feel it in our body. <laughs> and we have these superpowers and these superpowers are not mental, they are sensory. They're our smell, our sense of taste, our neural mirroring with other beings, um, our listening, our soft listening, our gestalt eyes that we don't use anymore, just looking out at the horizon, letting different ruffles of wind coming through the trees, cloud patterns, um, sparkles of water on leaves, begin to tell us stories and give us information about what's happening. Um, so these superpowers are there and they're going to help us to respond to the ecosystems and say, okay, what do you need? I know, I know what I think you need, but my idea of what you need has never been correct. I need to ask you what's actually wrong. Like Parsifal, the hero, goes to the Fisher King Amfortas and says, what ails thee? To break the story of human anthropocentrism, we need to ask the more than human world, for, what ails thee? What, what do you actually need? Um, but the portal into, these, into this somatic sensory questioning because we're not gonna do it with words. We're gonna do it with feeling and with seeing and being and interacting, tasting, touching is pain. That we've been ignoring our bodies for a long time. And when you ignore your body, you exhaust it. You store trauma, you clench. So I think that something I'm personally struggling with and, and, and working with is, is what does it mean to feel that pain and to be alongside it, to not problematize it, and to understand that it's going to accompany this process. Mm. Yeah, and we have, you know, thanks for bringing that because I think we have such also a complicated narrative around pain and around healing in the Western society. You know, we take painkiller. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic way to call it, painkillers. So we don't see the wisdom of it. So do you think that portal into the body, and I would say into the pain body and into the body is a way to maybe humble ourselves so we can hear, we can listen better because I feel we need a lot of humbleness to be able to listen to the ecological messages, to those messages from the mycelium. We really need to bring ourselves down. So I often feel of the pain body at my abuse and things that happen also. Is that a way for me to really bring, make sure I bring myself down to the earth that I go on my knees, that I pray down there on the ground, on the soil with the mother. I think whenever I feel, start to feel sterile in my pain and start to feel like no one knows what it's like to be me, it's important to let my wound show me where the wound is in the land. So something I think about is my connective tissue disease says, yeah, okay. You have this disease, it's a human disease. What is connective tissue disease teaching you about the degradation of the soil, the destruction of mycelial communities, um, that the only 8% of fungal communities are even identified? What if all of a sudden these moments of pain weren't about isolation, weren't about myself, but about showing me where to put my attention? And I think that pain can, can when we go inside of it and when we let it isolate us, it, it, para it destroys our ability to be dynamically participating in our world and in our relationships. But if we use it as a directive that shows us where the pain is in someone else or something else, it becomes transformative. It creates that connective relationship that goes both ways. Mm, I like that. It's beautiful. Yeah, I feel that that descent for me, I mean, it's been where most of the wisdom has came, has come, you know, just to be able to connect to that body because I was running around so much in my previous life that really being on the land the last two years, not being able to travel, just having to sit really brought so much wisdom to it. Someone was talking about the womb experience for men. How do we bring men into the womb experience, that feminine experience of recreation? I would love to hear your, your answer on that. I'll just share what my teacher told me in Peru. 
He said, we are always in the belly of the mother, always in the womb. We're in the belly of our mother. And when we come out, we're in the belly of the earth. And then we're going to go into another womb. So he said, we are always in the womb, always transforming, always in the belly growing. So we are always a little child, basically. That's another part of the Peruvian wisdom. We're never grown up. We're always this transforming child. But yeah, I'd love to hear your, your experience about that. You know, how do we also connect that rewilding of masculinity with a wild feminine that maybe is scary for for some men or for men in general i don't know so femininity for me has very much less to do with gender or being female but with gender with generative experience with, with with making with putting everything in the soup pot and with the moon and the moon isn't really gendered but the moon for me is the feminine in terms of Anyone can have a womb if your womb is the moon. Anyone can look up at the sky and see that, you know, like a, a womb will flux and wane, will bleed and release and then swell and create and make. And the moon does the same thing on a 28 day cycle. It's that mixing bowl of bothness. You, it, it holds everything and it creates everything. And then it's void occluded while also being completely replete, completely present behind that new moon. And I think that there are plenty of people who don't have a womb, who don't have a normal hormonal or gendered experience. And when I say normal, normal is a colonizer white term. <laughs> I don't know what normal is. I'm not normal. Nothing's normal. Um, if you're normal, it must be a terrible disease. Um, <laughs> I like that. When, I, when people say, like, how, how can the masculine have an experience of womb? I want to say, well, how can the feminine have an experience of womb? The womb is whatever is holding you. And the womb isn't in you. You're in it. No one has a womb. Everyone is in a womb. So I liked what you said a lot. Something I also feel, so I'll say that working with 28-day cycles, working with cyclical time rather than linear time is a kind of womb that returns you to yourself, that lets you sometimes release and not do anything and compost and sometimes generate and make and swell and sometimes just always be, you know, in process. But I also like to think of time as an embrace and as a womb, that we're held by our ancestors in our past, but we're also brought into being by our vision of the future and by our collective dreams, and by our, our storytelling, telling ourselves into stories, bringing other beings into stories. And then if we begin to feel our future and our past holding us, it's a type of womb that gives birth to ourself. Mm. Thank you, it's so beautiful the way you just articulated it. I really love that. Um, yeah, we're almost at the end of our talk <laughs> and I have like so many questions. I feel like I want to continue for, for way longer. Um, so I want to bring it back just for kind of a la last weaving before, uh, we close around the mycelium, just because I love mushroom. I love that. And I feel they connected us somehow. That's the reason we are here and we are connected. Um, I love baking bread, uh, sourdough bread. And, you know, it took me many years to realize that it was a mushroom, uh, <laughs> that, the yeast is a mushroom I didn't know for many years. And then I realized I was working with mushroom for so long without realizing it. And for me, it has become a very spiritual experience to make that bread and to work with that mushroom. And there is, um, yeah, a connection to, my, to that yeast that's in my fridge now for many years that keeps growing, that I'm feeding every other day, uh, that I have a relationship there. Uh, I feel in many ways that when I'm in connection to that mycelium, something happened in my body and that bread as a participation in my stories or in my life that is slightly different than when I buy something. So I have a relationship, let's put it, you know, in a simple way. So I would love to hear just one story uh, for you, from you about the mycelium and what your, you know, something you can share with us, something quite intimate connection with the mycelium and how, how is that relationship for you here? Oh, I have so many. One, <laughs> I have a 
I am very sensitive to environmental toxins, to molds, to, to, to mushrooms. And I've had this experience for years of being able to taste mushrooms or to taste molds as I was walking through the woods. And it was only, I think, when I was in college and I started to read about mycelium that I realized, and I would see these individual fruiting mushrooms, that I realized that as I was sensing and tasting these things, I was tasting below ground bodies. That I was being able, to, I was seeing underground through my sense of taste and smell. And I was seeing these large, these beings that couldn't be seen ever. That you, you know, the minute you chop up the soil, you destroy the body. You can't see these things. But I was seeing them with my whole body through this taste and smell experience. And so, so this intimate sensorial looping with mycelium has always directed me. Like I was in a house in a relationship once that was really, really bad for me and I knew it. And mushrooms are always on my side. They always show up to help me. And all of a sudden the house bloomed with black mold. It destroyed all of my objects. There were, it was one of the hottest, most humid, intense summers ever. It turned out the house, which was built in the early 1800s was over a blocked cellar filled with block, black mold. And it destroyed the relationship. It caused me to move. It destroyed all the objects over the relationship and it saved my life. <laughs> and it was, and all the mushrooms, remember that there were more mushrooms outside the house than I have ever seen. And it was this moment where I thought, okay, you guys are helping me. You're squeezing me. You're showing me exactly where to go. Um, I have so many stories. And something I'm very interested in are ghost pipes which are plants that are mycoheterotrophs with Russula and Lactarius um, mycelium under the ground, which is, they see, it seems parasitic that they take all of their nutrients from the mycelium. They're white because they don't need to photosynthesize. There's no chlorophyll. They seem like they're takers, but they problematize and clear our idea of relationships. What does it mean to take and to give? What does it mean to be in relationship? As someone who's sick and sometimes feels very needy in moments, Sometimes I'm radically independent. Sometimes I can hardly take care of myself and bathe. So sometimes I think of myself as being that ghost pipe that's plugged into the fungi, that's plugged into this help where my ability to give back isn't always apparent. Mm, I love that. I'm fascinated by the ghost pipe, by the way. And I always thought because of what you explained that those plants that are white, and obviously we see them a lot in the forest because they just stand out. And everybody say, well, they're parasitic because they have to take to survive. I always thought that they must give something that we don't see and we don't know about yet. Because everything is in relation and we, we don't really know, in fact, what's happening and why that species is there. We don't really know why each species is there anyway, but maybe there's something much bigger that this species is essential to the mycelium, to the trees that are for that mycelium that we don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, we, we think about relationships quantitatively, but there's some qualitative thing happening there. There's some magic that with our instruments, we can't measure. Maybe it's at a time scale, we don't know. Maybe it's evolutionary. Maybe in 5,000 years, that relationship tips in the opposite direction. Yeah, and bees love them, by the way, goes on them. So maybe that pollen as something very unique. That's always what I think. I say, maybe that pollen bring a medicine to the hive that's necessary for the survival. Brilliant. Ah. <laughs> what you think and, is like, we're thinking about these two beings being in a relationship, but it's actually like a hundred. <laughs> yes, much, yeah. much more being down that chain and that little ghost pipe is just in between. And it's extraordinary medicine for us as human too. I mean, it's also of other purpose. Um, thank you. Thank you. I just had so, so much fun here. And yeah, I, I wish we, we had more time. And I know there was a lot of comments. I tried to weave some of that comments and questions into the discussion tonight. Um, so I want to leave you the last word for tonight, Sophie. Uh, but first, I want to thank you and thank everyone that joined or that is listening on the recordings. Uh, it was really amazing. And yeah, it makes me want to go back into a dieta and take uh, four or five hours like you in the morning to just go through all my allies and all my connections to, to enlarge my council of beings that is around me to help me rewild, to expand my, my own mycelium into, into the forest and into what, what's around me. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and I leave you the last word and wishing a good evening to everyone. So here you go, Safi. 
Thank you, Angel. I believe that the only good hap thinking happens between people. So thank you for thinking with me and for helping me think better. I also believe that the greatest beings are composites of other beings. So thank you to everyone who came here and contributed their presence and their magic to some greater being that now is deliquescing out of being, but for a brief, beautiful moment on this night, thought together. Um, yeah, if I leave anyone with anything, ask a being tomorrow for its story and look, look weird doing it. Go outside, find the deer and say, what's up? <laughs> I give you permission to look like a fool. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Much blessing. Much blessings. <laughs>